There's going to be a lot of interesting firsts, starting with the first thing I've ever done any presentation, which is I'm actually going to have to change its name. This was Major Advancements in, in the <laughs> Lipid Energy Model, a new way of thinking for fat-based metabolism. Now it's going to be a brief review of the Lipid Energy Model and something else. Conflicts of interest, of course, the obligatory. I uh, do get some revenue from membership in Patreon. And uh, I also am a partner and managing director for, these, uh, for Owned Your Labs. By now, as Doug pointed out, most of you guys already know, I am a senior software engineer and platform architect. I did begin this journey in 2015 when uh, a sheet of paper that's eight and a half by 11 changed my life forever. I saw my cholesterol go up substantially. And then I became obsessed with lipidology and lipid metabolism. And of course, I've been doing frequent end of one experiments and biohacking ever since. This was supposed to be a big presentation around the major updates on the lipid energy model. But there has been a late breaking development and I have a sh I've had to shorten this original talk to make room for a second one. You'll understand why soon enough. So instead, this is going to first start with a quick refresher on the lipid energy model and I'm really only gonna take a few minutes, but it will be relevant later on. Again, we hypothesize that generally when healthy and, and adopting a low-carb diet, uh, you're going to see a little bit more free fatty acids released from your body fat. And that's good because that can be used by tissues in need. This in turn can also allow for more fatty acid uptake by the liver, which can likewise in turn allow for ketogenesis, which helps break down those fatty acids to turn them into ketone bodies. That can also be used for tissues in need. And of course, none of this is really that controversial. This is pretty much Keto 101. Where it does get a little more controversial is the second part of this, which is where we propose there's higher re-esterification of these fatty acids into triglycerides, and that allows for a higher secretion of these triglycerides on board lipoproteins as VLDL. And this allows for greater direct supply of VLDL to both adipose and non-adipose tissue, both to your fat and to your uh, tissues in the periphery. And here's the money shot. We also propose that there's a higher turnover of VLDL in delivering these triglycerides, which is why you actually see lower triglycerides in spite of higher triglyceride secretion, and thus higher resulting LDL particles. This part, however, is controversial, of course, and it's where a lot of my focus with this research has come into play. Now, what I've loved is in the last couple years, in 2020 and 2021, there have been many papers released that appear to, give, uh, that appear to provide strong evidence in support of the lipid energy model. And I'm excited to say I'm now closely collaborating with Nick Norwitz, who is formalizing this model for publication in the very near future. So stay tuned. Now on to the second secret presentation. Look, it's been quite a journey. For six years, I've sought to answer two questions since I got that fateful first lipid test. The first, obviously, is why do some of us see our cholesterol go up on a ketogenic diet and others don't? And that's what's led me to a lot of the experiments that I've done to date and, of course, the development of the lipid energy model. But I think a lot of us care a lot more about another question, which is, of course, for those of us who do see this increased cholesterol, are we in danger? And my short answer remains, I don't know. But we're seemingly as a result of metabolic fat adaptation. I'm cautiously optimistic. But that is a controversial statement because conventional medicine would insist we do know that if you have high LDL cholesterol, you are unmistakably at a higher risk for increased cardiovascular disease. No exceptions. In the early 1970s, doctors Brown and Goldstein saw a pivotal patient that, in their words, actually determined the scientific course of the rest of our lives. The patient was a little girl with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. And if you see her numbers, you can understand why the odds of getting this level of FH are actually one in a million. 
She had, and it's heartbreaking, but she had developed angina and xanthomas at age three and then had her first heart attack at age six. In the words of Dr. Goldstein, this little girl had only an elevated LDL. She had no high blood pressure. She had no diabetes. She didn't smoke. She didn't have a type A personality. Her only risk factor for having a heart attack at age six was this high level of LDL. So it's one of the best examples of a disease where we really know the cause. The cause of the disease in this little girl is her increased level of LDL. You've probably seen this graph before. This came out four and a half decades later, and it's stated right there in the title. Low-density lipoproteins cause atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. LDL causes CVD, full stop. Or you may have seen, actually at the far end of each axis, this is LDLR or FH. This is actually relevant to the very the little girl we were just mentioning before. And it's a little unintuitive the way the axes are organized, but it has to do with the efficacy on the proportional reduction of risk of CVD by the magnitude of exposure to lower LDLC. So lowering LDL tends to be very valuable for those people who have genetic FH. You may have also seen this one by Snyderman. This is eradicating the burden of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease by lowering ApoB lipoproteins earlier in life. And right over here, the most pronounced arrow is in familial hypercholesterolemia. And it's showing an LDLC of 390, which incidentally is lower than my colleague and good friend, Nick Norwitz, who has an LDL that's actually higher than that while he's on a ketogenic diet. But without question, if the higher LDL as resulting from FH is the primary driver of atherosclerosis in the absence, in the absence of other risk factors, it provides compelling evidence for the lipid hypothesis. That's just the truth. Well, around that same time in 2017, I wrote of this phenotype, the lean mass hyperresponder, a combined triad of extraordinarily high LDLC, LDL cholesterol, high HDL cholesterol, and low triglycerides. And this was something we see commonly on a ketogenic diet. And while I knew this was more common than most people realized, it turned out to be more common than I realized. Today, we have a lean mass hyperspawner Facebook group of over 7,000 members. I believe this phenotype holds many answers. I believe it's going to teach us important things about metabolism. But I also understand the reluctance of lipidology to study this, given the expectation of harm. We need to know whether this population is in danger. We need to know if they are rapidly developing atherosclerosis. So, two years ago, I launched a campaign for a study on lean mass hyperresponders. We set up a charity to collect donations, the Citizen Science Foundation, and I connected with doctors Tommy Wood and Spencer Nadowski to put together the protocol. And for those of you who don't know, Spencer Nadowski, who I also consider my good friend and colleague, he has a different opinion, and for that matter, a different prediction. Uh, while I'm cautiously optimistic with regard to this metabolic fat adaptation and it resulting in higher LDL, he's cautiously pessimistic and is, in, is concerned, of course, for both his patients and for everybody on low carb who might see this pronounced increase in LDL. Then, as part of this campaign, I asked for an insane amount of money to be raised, $200,000. And if I can just go off script for a second, for those of you in technology who are familiar with Kickstarter, you know that crowdfunding things is already really hard. They usually tell you not to try to raise anything more than 50,000 because even then, that's a lot to ask for. And that's when you can provide people like, say, tickets to an event or a movie or a product of some kind that they get for being the Kickstarter. Um, but no, I said, can you give me a couple hundred thousand dollars so I could get some data? That's, that was basically my pitch. But then you guys stepped up. And I mean, a lot of people that I know are already in this room. A lot of you guys have contributed to the Citizen Science Foundation, and I just have to thank you so much for that. So I have to tell you, the study has taken a lot of work behind the scenes to put together. Given the many ways it is unique, it's just got a lot of complications to it, but we knew one day we'd finally get to launch it. And that day is today. <laughs> On behalf of the Citizen Science Foundation, I'm pleased to announce the Lean Mass Hyperresponder Study begins now. 
I, I have waited years to say that. So <laughs> let's get into the details that I've not been able to share up until this very moment in time. I'm going to give you an introduction to the center running the study, the major eligibility criteria, how to join and what is involved, the crucial data we're collecting and why it matters, and an interview with our principal investigator. All right, so let me introduce you to the center because I know you know about the Citizen Science Foundation, and by now many of you have been following along know about the team. Well, we're going to be handling the funding, recruitment, and travel arrangements, but who's the center that we're working with? It's the prestigious Lundquist Institute. They'll be handling the participant examination, the blood work, and the CT scanning. But who's the principal investigator in charge? Well, many of you in this room, okay, some of you in this room, definitely on the doctor side, may already recognize this photo. It is the incomparable Matt Budoff. Now, to say Matt Budoff has a long resume is like saying the surface of the sun is a little warm. Uh, he's, I, I'm, I'm going to read just a few of these. Uh, he's um, an internationally recognized researcher, vice president of the Society of Atherosclerosis of Imaging, and a founding board member of the Society of Cardiovascular CT, and an author of the updating guidelines for the use of CT for calcium assessments and the competency guidelines for peripheral CT and MRI. Anyway, there's a short list for what would be considered the foremost experts in cardiology, uh, in CT imaging especially, and many just straight up consider him the foremost expert. He is, of course, based out of UCLA with the Lundquist Institute, just a little north of here in San Diego, up, at, uh, up in LA. And I should mention the data sharing is limited during the study, but will be provided after in stages. And this is something that's come up a lot as we've been talking about this study, is if you know that the Lundquist Institute is making use of it, then you should be aware that since they're doing the investigations, no identified data will be shared outside of Lundquist at any point in time. But de-identified data will be shared, but only after completion of their scheduled phases. So they'll be doing all of the work behind the scenes, and at points in time, they'll actually be able to share the data outside for us to be able to use for the research. So, finally, the major eligibility criteria. And before I get into this, let me just emphasize that while many of you already know the cut points for lean mass hyperresponders as I've defined them before, we've actually relaxed them just a little bit, so it's actually even a little bit easier to get into this study. To be eligible for this study, participants must, one, have been on their current diet for two years or longer. And to interpret that, you have to understand that given a lean mass hyperresponder study, or sorry, status, this almost guarantees participants would be on what would be considered a ketogenic diet in practice. But we want to avoid using this specific term given it has many variations of meaning across social media. For example, I know some lean mass hyperresponders that have more carbs than I could have, and they still have very ketogenic numbers. Two, participants had an LDL cholesterol of 160 milligrams per deciliter or below before adopting a low-carb diet. So historically, they had lower cholesterol levels and have seen an increase of 50% or more in their LDL cholesterol to at least 190 milligrams per deciliter or above since adopting a low-carb diet. So there's technically three different criteria here. And I'm going to give you a couple examples to make it easier. So if your LDL was, say, 100 before, and it changed to 200 after, well, then you would have been lower than 160, above 190, and you would have seen an increase of 100%. But let's say that instead, your LDL was 150 to begin with, and then you went to 200. Well, that fits two of the criteria, but it's, a, it's an increase of 33%, not 50%. Part of the reason for this criteria is we want to rule out people who've had, the, uh, who've had likely genetic FH beforehand, but on top of that, we have further genetic testing in addition to it. Four, you have an HDL cholesterol of 60 milligrams per deciliter or above, and you have triglycerides of 80 milligrams per deciliter or below. And last of the major criteria is that you score less than a 5% on the ACC AHA risk calculator. Again, the, uh, the link is provided here at cvriskcalculator.com. 
Now, I should emphasize, I've just gone through the six major criteria, and that'll probably knock out most people, but there is a lot of criteria beyond that, but you need to contact the Lundquist Institute to uh, find out more. Uh, I can't actually speak to it, I'll just put it that way. So if you meet all of these major criteria, as I just described, I want you. <laughs> I want you in this study, and this is the link. You can go there right now. If you're watching this live, feel free. Go on there. If you're watching it on a video, pause. Go to this link. If you or anybody you know fits that major criteria, I want you to check into the study. Now I'm going to talk about how to join and what's involved. Well, of course, I just told you this is where the link is that you go to. This is how you'll contact the Lundquist Institute. Their contact information can be found there. If you qualify, you schedule an appointment with Lundquist, and then they alert us, the Citizen Science Foundation, to book your travel. We handle that portion of it. Study overview for participants, this is what you can expect. You'll fly to Los Angeles for the afternoon or evening before your appointment in the morning the next day. Let me emphasize that again. Fly to Los Angeles for, your, uh, for the afternoon or evening before your appointment because we want you to check into a hotel, get plenty of rest. You may enjoy dinner on us if it's not too late in the evening. We want to do this because we we want you to plan to be 12 to 16 hours water only fasted for the morning appointment at Lundquist where you'll get your CT scan, blood work, and so forth. And then you fly back home. Then for the next year, every morning throughout, you'll be testing your ketone levels with a Keto Mojo device to confirm your beta hydroxybutyrate is generally at five millimoles or higher. And then at the midpoint during the year, Lundquist will check in on you with some additional questions. Lastly, about a year later, you'll repeat everything you did in the first visit. And at that point, you'll be able to complete your contribution to the study. Now, of course, the crucial data we're collecting and why it matters. Obviously, it's about the plaque. We're tracking plaque progression. It's assumed the vast majority of people have some degree of overall plaque progression, known, of course, as atherosclerosis over time. Capturing plaques by CT angiograms at one point in time, and again at a later point in time, known as longitudinal data, gives us enormous insight into the overall progression level of atherosclerosis. To be sure, high-resolution CTA longitudinal data has mainly been collected on high-risk populations, not on low-risk populations, but that's okay because this gives us plenty to work with. We'll have powerful data when combined with single-scan studies of both high- and low-risk populations for comparison. Again, remember the example of familial hypercholesterolemia and how rapidly we see those plaque levels for that context. If we have somebody with homozygous FH and they were going through these scans, we would absolutely be seeing that progression longitudinally. So when you look at this grouping of people, this is 100 different figures, you're looking at less than 3% or just three of what I've circled here. In the US population, have an LDL cholesterol of 190 milligrams per deciliter or higher. Think about that, that's the floor for our eligibility. So given lean mass hyperresponders have this LDL cholesterol on the top 3% of the population, it would commonly be expected that they would likewise have a high progression of atherosclerosis. Certainly that's what every doctor is telling them, uh, such as in the highest third of the general population. And indeed, we have so much from lipidology that suggests that that's exactly what the expectation would be. Conversely, where lean mass hyperresponders have LDL cholesterol on the top 3%, it would run counter to conventional expectations to observe a low progression of atherosclerosis, such as in the lowest third of the population. Plainly stated, a high magnitude of plaque progression is easy to detect with CT image comparison in a very short span of time. Many existing studies have demonstrated this. And while we will certainly be looking at many more aspects of these plaques, their overall progression of po at a population level, at a population level, will help provide powerful evidence regarding magnitude of expected risk. Now, 
Interestingly, as we get closer to this study, there have been many who predict lean mass hyperspondors will demonstrate low progression of atherosclerosis, but speculate their progression would be even lower were every other risk factor the same, save a low LDL cholesterol rather than a high. In other words, lean mass hyperspondors would be, perhaps in their words, low risk but suboptimal when compared to the lowest possible risk. Given our study doesn't have a control, it is unlikely to provide much in the way of answering this speculation if the plaque progression were low enough to suggest this. I'm going I'm to step off script for just a second. Believe me, I think a lot of people in this room would love if that's where the goalposts were because that's just a very different place than where we all think that it is or at least for where we are concerned it could be. We're all very interested in whether or not, at a minimum, we're above average for a cardiovascular disease risk, much less down in, say, the lowest third. Regardless, low progression of plaque for lean mass hyperspondus at a population level would be a substantial finding if that's what we see in this outcome. Again, no one knows what these data will show until the study is complete. And I have to emphasize that over and over again. Even if I've had a fairly decent track record in a lot of my predictions and my hypotheses and so forth, I really do want to I really do want to emphasize, I just don't know until we really are getting the data and we find out for ourselves. This is what's neat. Beyond CT angiograms, since we're here, we're, getting, we're given a unique opportunity to advance science through wide-spectrum genetic and blood testing. I think that we're going to be picking up a lot of data from lean mass hyperspondus that are going to open up a lot of new chapters. That's my prediction. And I'm very excited to do this now. I'm actually going to be playing you a video that's a discussion between myself and Matt Budoff on the study, CTA, and its implications. It's about 15 minutes long, and it's worth every second of your time because we're actually going to be covering a lot of the questions you likely would have, and for that matter, many people outside of the low-carb community would probably have regarding this study. So please enjoy. Dr. Budoff, thanks, yeah. for, thanks for joining me. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> Heart disease is the number one killer in the world for almost a century now. The number one target for prevention and treatment is LDL cholesterol. Now I looked and it appears it's been almost about 50 years since doctors Brown and Goldstein merged their laboratories to start the seminal work that would eventually earn them the Nobel Prize in finding that a high LDL, particularly in those who have familial hypercholesterolemia, demonstrated a high rate of atherosclerosis, particularly in those who otherwise didn't seem to have any other cardiovascular risk disease factors. Would it be fair to say that we know of no population for which high LDL doesn't have a likewise association with high risk of heart disease? That's, to my knowledge, that's correct. So we're now embarking on something truly new, very different, because up until this point in time, there hasn't actually been such a thing as diet-induced hypercholesterolemia that you're aware of, right? Yeah, not to the degree that we see with these specific diets. Obviously, people can eat poorly and their LDL can go up a little bit, but not, not to the degree that we see with these, with these type of diets. Have you yourself, before even we started chatting, do you have patients under your care who exhibit these same profiles that we're going to be looking into for the study we're about to do? Yes, uh, I have a few patients who've, uh, um, through you know, relatively um, aggressive diets, have raised their LDLs considerably. And granted, any amount of data that you've gotten up until this point is very limited, necessarily, because this is just a handful of people. Yeah, it's a handful of people and they weren't followed prospectively and looked at in any systematic way. So really, the only way to assess this is to really do a systematic study. Right. Now, to be fair, some people are going to raise concerns. They're going to say, look, at the end of the day, we have more than enough data that high LDL will result in a high progression of atherosclerosis. So we really shouldn't even bother doing a study. We should make sure that everybody does have high LDL take on treatment to lower it. Do you feel that that should preclude us doing a study on this? No, I think there's definitely equipoise here. We have uh, uh, evidence that these patients in general, despite their high LDLs, do well 
uh, over time. So there's anecdotal evidence or non-randomized evidence that the diet that they do well on these type of diets despite the high LDL. And then obviously we have this LDL hypothesis that would argue that these high LDLs are bad under any circumstance. But, but I think there's enough equipoise that we should do a clinical trial to kind of establish the right answer. Do you think there's anything of special interest with there being also a high HDL cholesterol in combination with low triglycerides when combined with a high LDL cholesterol? Yeah, you know, I think that HDL, while it's been somewhat uh, maligned over the past uh, few years, is still a very good predictor of future cardiovascular disease. And we use ratios, total cholesterol to HDL or triglycerides to HDL to try to establish how atherogenic or how dangerous a, a condition may be. Um, high HDL is very, very est well established that it's protective for cardiovascular disease. So a high cholesterol, total cholesterol or LDL and a high HDL may actually balance in, in many cases. And there's a lot of good examples of that as well. So, so a lot of this potential harm of high LDL may be offset by a potential benefit of high HDL. It's interesting because I find even though I proactively emphasize, me personally, that I'm quote unquote cautiously optimistic with this context, with high LDL and the context of it being from metabolic fat adaptation, that even that position by itself is considered very controversial. And I'm sometimes described as a controversial figure uh, that position alone is problematic in trying to move this science forward. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, I think whenever you have a majority of people who feel that, you know, one answer is m much more likely correct than another, then there raises questions about whether you should allow people to continue to be exposed to this. But again, I think that there's, especially with high HDL and low triglycerides, we know that that's a cardioprotective state. And now we have some evidence that, you know, we have to see how the two balance out. Right. We, we certainly agree that while a lot of this anecdotal evidence may look good, there's still lots of problems. There could be selection bias. There could be a number of people that we don't know about for which survival bias may play a part. Therefore, we need a prospective clinical trial, right? Absolutely. And I think anybody who argues that we don't need a prospective clinical trial is probably coming from a pretty extreme personal viewpoint because we've been surprised before. Things that we thought were obvious, uh, hormone replacement therapy in women, it was obvious from the observational data that they would benefit from that. And some people said, we don't need to do a clinical trial. Why put them on placebo and risk? And then we found out that, that the estrogen replacement had no benefit for these women and, and that we were exposing millions of women to something that might actually be having some side effects and not, not affording them the, the benefit that we thought it was. So randomized trials proved that some of our observations are, are incorrect. So our central test for this trial is going to be a CT angiogram. Can you explain why this is a superior test for us to be tracking the progression of atherosclerosis? Yeah, I mean, really, it's the only test that, that affords us the ability of looking at plaque in the coronaries over time in an asymptomatic or, or less symptomatic population. The only alternative is intravascular ultrasound, or what we call IVUS, but that's really unethical to take a relatively uh, healthy or person who feels well and subject them to a very invasive test that has a risk of, of causing very serious complications, including death. Uh, as, a, as, an, as an adverse uh, event. So I think using a less invasive tool that gives us really good definitions of plaque and plaque quantity, and then assessing them again with that same non-invasive tool is gonna be the, the only really option that we have to really answer this question. Now, it's gonna be difficult for us to compare this to a truly healthy population because as I understand it, we don't actually have a lot of longitudinal CTA data on healthy populations with low progression of atherosclerotic plaque. Would that be correct? 
That's correct. We have uh, uh, some new um, evolving data sets of, of population-based assessments of CT and geography. There's a study we're working on uh, called Miami Heart, which took healthy people and, and got CT and geography. That's only one point in time. So we don't have the progression rate in that population, but at least we can look at prevalence of, of plaque and compare it to that healthy asymptomatic population as, a, as one point of reference. Um, but yes, this is uh, fairly unique, and that's usually why we have uh, placebo groups or, or some control group to make sure that the rates of progression that we're assessing in the active group is different or is um, similar to a, to a controlled population. This actually is a good thing to bring up because we are likely going to need to address this. A lot of people would understandably say, hey, why not go ahead and also have a control group? But as I like to try to explain, we have a bit of a problem. It's actually so ubiquitous that people who are very lean, athletic, and very low carb actually exhibit this particular lipid profile that it's actually harder to find people that exhibit all those three and don't get the lipid profile. But on top of that, it's actually hard to get a lot of those who were already non-adherent to treatment options to now go on, say, medical therapy, such as going on a statin or something like that to lower their LDL to then become a control group. So a lot of us on our team, we acknowledge that this is a pilot study. You know, it's the beginning of a chapter, not necessarily the end of one. Would that be a fair statement? No, absolutely. And we have many other cohorts to look at rates of progression to at least have some basis of comparison uh, in the absence even of a control group to, to be able to assess you know, where this group lies in the spectrum and, and the rates of progression and what we've seen under the influence of different therapies. The way that we've set this study up, even though myself... Doctors Spencer Nadalski and Tommy Wood are the originating team that have come to you and Lundquist to get this study done. At no point in time will my team actually have access to the identified data. Is that correct? That's correct. By definition, we have to we have to be uh, protective of all patients' uh, privacy. Uh, these HIPAA laws, uh, health protection. Uh, laws and uh, and make sure that the privacies of, of all of the participants are maintained and also the integrity of the study is maintained. So it'll just be my, my investigative team that'll have access and even uh, when I read the studies, I'm blinded. I don't know what what patients are on, what therapies or what their LDLs are or, or, or what they are done. And when we read the follow-up studies, we anonymize the time. So we don't even know which study came first. So we'll look at two studies side by side, but, but first study, second study will be unknown. So if we see progression or regression, we won't know which one it is until the readers are unblinded. So we take this all of this blinding very seriously, and certainly your team won't have access to any of the data um, until we've, we've finalized our analyses. Well, and that's also important because there may be some who raise concerns that our team could have access to it, could change things, could manipulate things. That's all not even possible. Would yeah, that, be that would never be possible. Our, our really, our statistician is really the only person who would have the key to unblind any of these uh, studies. So everything else will be anonymized by my research team, by, by myself, and then ultimately any data that we share with you would still be bundled and anonymized. You would see group A or group B, or you might see a spectrum of patients, but you won't know who they are. They would just be patients one through 26 or one through 42 or whatever we have at the time when we're doing our initial analyses. Likewise, there's gonna be some on the skeptic side of the fence who will possibly think that maybe calibrations or software might change from the first set of scans to the second that might make it look as though there was more plaque that developed in the second set of scans, all of that's not really possible, right? Yeah, that would be impossible because when we, we read the studies for plaque quantity, our final endpoint, together with both scans paired. So whatever software we're using at that time, it's going to be the same for scan one and scan two. And again, because we anonymize the date, we don't even know which one is really scan one or scan two. So it'll just be read. So, you know, even if somebody thought, oh, they might have a, the reader may have a bias that people with ILDL should progress. 
they won't know which scan is the first one taken and which is the second one taken. So they won't even have that that even that potential bias is impossible to to interfere in our in our interpretations. And it's all automated software anyway. So it really is not that user dependent. So it, it's really very very trivial uh, opportunities to to bias the work in any way. So at the most basic level, we can effectively just compare total plaque volume versus total plaque volume. Would that be correct? Yes. I, I mean, I think, you know, there's different endpoints that we're going to decide in advance so that it's all predetermined. So we don't look at the final data and then say, oh, that, that's interesting. Let's make that our primary endpoint. But it'll all be predetermined. Uh, we usually use non-calcified plaque as our total non-calcified plaque as our primary endpoint just because calcified plaque doesn't change at the same rates as the other plaques do and might be influenced by other factors. Um, but, but that'll be, that's predetermined and that's going to be standardized uh, to all of our other studies that we've done. And we've done a lot of these CT and geographic studies. This will be probably our 14th or 15th randomized trial looking at different effects. We've done things with, with garlic therapies, we've done things with fish oil uh, therapies, and we've done a number of, their, of, of traditional medications, prescription medications with randomized trials, um, looking at the effects of plaque over time. So again, we'll have a lot of comparator cohorts to look at as well as, as looking at this cohort as a standalone. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Buaf. Oh, it's a pleasure, thank you for having me. think he's the right guy? <laughs> so now I want to finish with a special thanks. I have so many to thank, but there are a few that require a special distinction. The first, everyone, past, present, and future, who have reached into their pockets to contribute to the CitizenScienceFoundation.org to show their support for this study. From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. This historic endeavor simply wouldn't be possible without your help. Thank you. Second, the staggering generosity of Keto Mojo and GB Health Watch, who both of these incredible companies have contributed 100% of their product and services to this study. And hold your applause for a sec. I see you guys. I want you both to stand real quick. Dorian and Gemma, please stand. I can tell you from working with them, they are bona fide saints. I'm just so proud to have you guys helping us with this study. Thank you so much. Lastly, a very big thanks in advance to the amazing participants who will be joining this study. While I certainly admit my bias before saying this, I truly believe this research will provide us a wealth of data unlike any other. So, Thanks for watching, and if you or anyone you know may be eligible for this study, please visit citizensciencefoundation.org slash study, and for social media, please use hashtag LMHRstudy. Thank you so much. This is super exciting, and I'm pretty sure I have two postmenopausal patients that might fit your, fit your criteria. But I was hoping you could talk a little bit about exclusion criteria, because they're both on bioidentical hormone replacement therapy with estradiol, which I know could be a confounding factor. Well, unfortunately, while I'm allowed to talk about the major inclusion criteria, or I guess, I don't know which one it is, I will say there are a lot of inclusion and exclusion criteria that we did determine in the protocol, but that I'm not allowed to talk about. If they fit the major inclusion criteria, you reach out to the Lundquist Institute at the link, and all the information is there, and then they'll take you through it there. It's, it's an important process that has to be followed exactly right, so. Thank you. Great, I'm so excited this has been funded finally. So my question is about the ketone levels that you'll be monitoring. A lot of lean mass hyperresponders, including myself, tend to run low on the ketone side. I'll wake up like 0 0.3, 0 0.4, sometimes 0 0.5 to, point, to 1.0. So are they going to be really strict about that? Because it can really vary every morning, even if you're still on a ketogenic diet. Uh, I can say that it doesn't have to be 100%. Uh, I'm not actually sure if I'm allowed to say what the threshold of variability is. 
Um, but I am very aware of what you're describing. A lot of my answers are going to sound like the following, which is the team decided. Because, of course, we don't want to get in a position where, you know, one person said that they said this, another person said that, and so forth. This was just what got determined at the end, of, at the end stage of where we ended up. So I will say it's not, I can say this much, it's not an 100% every single morning requirement. It's, that's why I said generally at uh, 0.5 millimoles or higher. Hi, Dave. Lean mass hyper responder here, so I'm going to be signing up. Um, I'm excited because my partner is actually a cardiologist, and we do a series of cardiac testing for about 90% of our patients before they can even start keto with me. Um, so I look forward to potentially partnering with you guys in some fashion in the future. What I wanted to say to the group is, she used to be very traditional in her approach. Everyone gets thrown on a statin. And be, when I joined her practice, she started to realize that I have all these people with LDLs of like 150 to 190, 200. And when she was doing their testing, she's like, hmm, I'm not finding anything in their arteries. And I was like, I've been trying to tell you this for four years. I think one endpoint that could potentially come out of this study is I had a patient with a very severe abdominal aortic aneurysm, and after six months on, on my program, they couldn't find it anymore, right? Wow. So I, I have read evidence of keto possibly helping to clear out former plaque, and that might be something this study would find. I hope you guys have a big flight budget, because I'll probably be sending a lot of our patients your way for this study. So. <laughs> Anyway, flights from Hawaii aren't cheap, so anyway, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's great. That's great extra data. And, I, and I'm going to say this with reservation. So I'm going to say that obviously there's a level of data we've gotten anecdotally that's given me some level of confidence for my cautious optimism, while likewise acknowledging exactly what Dr. Budoff was saying, a lot of critics of you know, those seeing high LDL on low carb saying, which is that we need better data, and that's exactly what we're doing. Yeah. So, of course, it's possible that there's survivor bias, you know, maybe some people are banning the diet before there's an issue. That's all possible. That's why prospective data is just gonna be so useful for all of us, including your, your partner, yeah. of course. Thank you. Eric Westman, Durham, North Carolina. Thanks. Um, Eric who? Westman. <laughs> Uh, that's W E S. <laughs> Congratulations, Dave. Thank you uh, so much, Eric. Long time coming, and I'm still thinking about this. What is the sample size? It was never mentioned. Oh, sorry, 100. We're getting 100 lean mass hyperresponders. How did you come up with that number? You know, I, I don't think this falls under the, the team decided. I'll just go ahead and say it's a number I wanted. I wanted 100 because I feel like 100 is a nice. I, Given the effect size, as you, I'm sure you are aware, you could take a bunch of people with uh, you know, LDL of 300, 400, and really that the bunch needs to only be like 20. But I think that, that, I think that hitting 100 has a lot more impact than hitting 20, even with the higher effect size exposure. So it really was something I kind of pushed for a lot, and uh, it's ultimately what we ended up with. So. And then why one, why one center and fly people? Why not have multiple centers around the country? That was also kind of me. I, I like, I mean, I know you guys do a lot of studies that are in multiple centers. The more that I've learned about the process, the more there's some reservations I've had with doing it in multiple centers, that I've appreciated the, the opportunity to have one center, one set of equipment, one team that's in use and the degree with which, you know, we could be partnering and very in close contact with the process and the procedures, uh, also the means by which to course correct, depending on the circumstances. I think all of that's important, or at least it, it is to me, that's for sure. Can we charter a flight from RDU? Uh, ch ch charter a flight? Charter a flight full of my patients from oh, Duke. Of course. <laughs> It'd save us a lot of money, Eric, that would be great. Hi, thanks very much. My name's Graham Simpson. 
I was curious if you were going to do, you know, Kraft and Stout and others obviously talk about insulin resistance as being the major cause, and in fact, 100%, they believe, of people having cardiovascular disease have basically, you know, insulin resistance and a sugar problem. And I was wondering, are you going to do insulin resistance um, testing like Kraft's, like a one hour, three hour, and look at their the sort of insulin levels as part of your test? I, I would love to do that, but no, we, we don't have a craft test built into the existing protocol. Is we, that a possibility or is it too late to do that? Because I think, you know, many people like William Castelli believe, you know, he doesn't look at LDL and treat it unless it's over 300. So um, it seems that, you know, that would be a really important thing to add to your protocol. Perhaps it's an easy test to do. You've got them there for 12 hours and uh, fasting as well. It would, it's not a hard test to do. We should talk after this because you might be new to how insanely difficult it is to get <laughs> even the smallest of these things worked out. A protocol, a craft protocol would be interesting, but I, I also... You don't have to do a five hour, you're, what, three hours is plenty. I mean, as long as it's less than 60 millimoles of insulin, you're good. We'll, we'll talk more after this. Yeah. Just okay. trust me, that's, it, it wouldn't be a small tack on, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hi, Dave. Hi. Uh, congratulations on your study launch. Um, I'm curious as to whether you're controlling for confounding factors, uh, especially um, when you're recruiting within the keto community. A lot of the, uh, uh, people who uh, are aware of the numbers are uh, people who have uh, turned their lives around and, and are probably making a lot of lifestyle changes. Uh, in addition to just eating keto, uh, maybe you know, exercising more might just be one of the, you know, many possible things I could think of. So in terms of that, how are you going to treat the, the confounding factors that this cohort that you're selecting from the community might just be people who care a lot more about their health uh, now than, than the general population? I'm actually really glad you brought that up. So of course you're describing healthy user bias as it's typically referred to in epidemiology. And without question, we're embracing healthy user bias. I mean, to try to put this in perspective, if, if you could grab the healthiest individuals you could and then make them three pack a day smokers, do you think that all of their healthy user bias would prevent them from developing atherosclerosis? I don't, because I feel like the evidence is compelling enough for me thus far, given what I've come to understand with Bradford Hill and so on and so forth. Likewise, is there something lean mass hyperresponders are doing right that people with homozygous FH are doing wrong? Well, my guess is that, well, of course, this is where it gets a bit more controversial. I think there's more to the story with lipid metabolism dysfunction and so forth that may differentiate. But the larger question is, can you even pick a population for which the lipid hypothesis wouldn't apply universally? And that's why we don't mind if there's some degree of possibility for healthy user bias. We don't necessarily want to exclude it. It could be that there's something else other than what we're uh, aware of at baseline that it turns out that they have in common. That's fine. That's why it's a pilot study. That's why we can learn a lot more past that point if we find out that there's any kind of difference to be made. Thank you. Hi, Dave. Uh, congratulations, Arthur Agatston. I can tell you I've known Matt Budoff since he was a cardiology fellow at the University of Illinois, and there's, there's nobody better uh, for this. Um, one thing you know, he mentioned was obviously you can't do intravascular ultrasound on, on patients like this, but carotids is simple. It, it, did that come up to add to look? You can see soft early plaque you know, on, on carotids, um, and so that might You're, be... Yeah, you're talking a carotid intima media thickness yeah. test, right? Yeah. And, and actually looking, looking for plaque as well as the intima media thickness, new plaque. So there were, this is another one of those team answers. <clears throat> Lots of yeah. things were investigated as to what we could both afford and have time for. Um, that was something that came up. Ultimately, we, we didn't end up having that uh, be a part of the protocol. I would love, though, to have the laundry list. I'd love to have, like, everything sure. everywhere. But... Um, but we do have a lot of faith in CT angiogram in particular, uh, particularly given the, I mean, it's not just that Budoff's a great salesman for what he's already an expert in. We did a lot of our own homework and we were like, oh, actually, yeah. Like, 
when we were first talking about the study, I was thinking we needed five years. And it was after consulting with Dr. Budoff and other experts and then doing the work, just like, no, actually, we, this one year is plenty of time, given the exposure time relative to what the expected outcome is. Yeah. Um, and the CTA will give us a lot of that right there. No, it, it will. I, actually, I'm involved with the Miami Heart Trial, uh, led, led by Kurum Nasser, which, um, uh, which he's, he's collaborating on. So he's great. Um, the one <coughs> other point, uh, sort of theoretical, is in fact tomorrow I'll show cases of uh, cholesterols, uh, LDLs, well over 190 uh, with zero scores as well as those with high scores. And we feel, something I learned from Ron Krauss, that it's residence time. It's not the LDL per se, it's the clearance of LDL. And in true FH, um, you're missing half the receptors, so the LDL is hanging around the bloodstream longer, getting oxidized and, and, and gluconated. And there's some people with similar um, high LDLs, but obviously have enough receptors in, and don't uh, have that. And, you know, so that measuring residence time, it's, it's actually true people with very high HDLs, sometimes a lot of plaque, you know, the really small LDLs. Uh, it all seems to be about residence time, which is very hard to measure, but just measuring it in a few for the future might be uh, something, um, something to think about. Yeah, definitely. I, I, think it's, I think it's of a lot of interest. I'll concede my own bias. I think that it has a bit more to do with success or failure of lipid metabolism itself, particularly at a cellular level. So a lot of times they're seeing, oh, if the receptors work really well, then there doesn't, uh, let me give you an example. Um, um, PCSK9 loss of function, right. right? We know that to have very low levels of LDL and therefore it's assumed that the lower rates of cardiovascular disease with that population uh, is due to less of the LDL being resident, the bloodstream, right? But conversely, there's A-beta lipoproteinemia, hypo-beta lipoproteinemia, those folks aren't doing as well, especially in the case of like all-cause mortality. I think that the, the difference between those two is with the PCSK9 loss of function, sorry, I'm getting a bit geeky, guys. Um, yeah. the, the cells uh, of interest are actually succeeding, if even over-succeeding, at getting the lipids. In the case of A-beta lipoproteinemia, it never gets into the bloodstream to begin with. Yeah. So there's the absence of cells getting what it is that they're needing. So if you have, say, a receptor binding issue, yeah. a cell wanting to get the lipid or the lipoprotein, in having some inhibition there, you find not just with receptors, not just with LDL, but things like lipoprotein lipase dysfunctions and all sorts of things, they all can lead towards atherosclerosis. And that's why I think it comes back to, look, is your, is your body succeeding or failing at metabolizing fats or for that matter, lipoproteins? And a lot should start from there, is my personal opinion. And the bottom, one of the bottom lines is with imaging, you know, if they're building up plaque, some bad is going on. If they're not, you're, 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 you're good. Right. Well, uh, this is, and so exactly. This and that's is why great. I like, that's why I like that's, Dr. Budoff's answer yeah. is he loves non-calcified non plaque to measure. I think that's a fantastic metric. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. And congratulations. Thank you so much. I can't believe I'm asking a question after him. <laughs> um, so on the study, I'm assuming that the CT angiograms will be dye contrast. Is that yes. correct? Is, has there been any concern about that? Because I've been told, oh, the, you know, the, the risk with the um, radi you know, radial, what am I thinking of, that that, that has a risk um, involved with that. It does. It's it's. You know, I don't want to sound like I'm overselling it, but it is extraordinarily minuscule. I myself have had two CTAs, um, and the I, and ironically, I think I, if anything, I care a little bit more about the radiation exposure. But even then, that's like really small. Like I had two millisieverts for the last one, which I think free living for a year is something like three and a half or four or something like that. But the um, the contrast dye wasn't as concerning for me. But it can't. It is. There is a risk, and I. I I don't want to say what I think that it is because I'm afraid I'll misspeak what it is. But I can tell you the Lundquist Institute goes over that. So any participant who's calling in, they will inform you of all of the risks that's part of the literature that's provided and gets discussed. So 
Okay, so, so the cardiologists that tell me that it's too high of a risk to do it every few years is, I mean, it's all relative, right? It's, it's up to the individual to determine, sure. you yeah. know, what that is. Congrats. That's Thank great. you so much. Hey, just a point of clarification. Um, for, for an otherwise healthy person without high LDL, um, I guess the average he healthy American uh, who is relatively young, wouldn't the normal kind of rate of plaque progression be zero? So if, if there's any progression at all in this group, wouldn't that kind of be an argument against LM, lean mass hyperresponders being kind of a healthy state to be in? Well, actually, my understanding is, and, and this would be a great one for Budap to be here, but certainly in the time that I've been researching it, it's presumed that everybody has some rate of progression. In fact, it's often brought up how, you know, children even, they'll find some degree of um, fatty um, streaks, uh, even at a fairly young age. Now, it's also assumed that there is some threshold. It's just very abnormal, or at least, I guess, given typical diets to where if you get your LDL, say, below, I think, 60 or 50 or something like that, then you won't have the development of uh, atherosclerosis. But that's, that's typically achieved through either you know, heavy medication or very high carb, low fat diet or something along those lines. And we still need prospective clinical data for that. Uh, I, I'm interested in seeing that as well. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. I wonder why first you didn't do it with the Doppler study of the carotid arteries that you explained to the doctor before he asked the question. But I wonder also, about the CT scan. If can, going, can, I'm sorry, can you repeat the first part? The, you wonder did, what, my first question was about the carotid plug arteries that you can check with Doppler ultrasound with a non-invasive study. And the other thing, and you explained it that you responded to the other uh, question that asked the doctor. But about the CT scan, if you are able just to check the calcium score, which are a critical point for the cardiologist, and if you are able to detect inflammatory uh, problems other than the metabolic with a CT. Am I, let me see if I can, so am I able to check inflammatory yes. markers with the CT? Yes. Or yes, like, you know, in the, the thickening of the intima or the endothelium is one point of the, of the disease. The plug is a different one. I wonder if the, with the CT studies that you are going to plan in this study, you are able to detect the thickening or the inflammatory progress, problems just in the coronary arteries. Uh, yeah, so let me, let me take a step back. I think this will answer your question. So the, my understanding is there's the identification of the plaques that can be identifiable with the CT imaging. It's not the overall, it's not the aggregate of your total coronary uh, intima. It's actually specifically identifiable plaques, and from there, quantifying the plaque volume on a per plaque basis, yeah. then combining them together to then look at overall aggregate plaque change. So this is a common mistake that does get made with CT imaging, is that it's assumed that there's like some large aggregate score that can account for all thickening in the wall, and that's not that's not exactly what the study is doing per se. And Budoff might be better to answer this than I would, but my understanding is we identify the specific plaques of interest. And from that, do a comparison on the successive scan of both those plaques or any new emerging plaques, or of course any disappearance of plaques if there's actual regression. Does that, did that help answer the? Yes, yes, you explain how are you proceeding to the study? How am I what? What are the proceeding of your study? But it's, uh, I wonder if this study is checking only, because you are embarked in a very difficult problem on the limb, mass, uh, limb muscle. But I wonder about the atherosclerotic problem, not only as a metabolic problem, as an inflammatory process. I certainly agree. I think that atherosclerosis is definitely an inflammatory disease um, in large part. I mean, there may be some ways in which it's not, but we so often see that close correlation with uh, inflammation, so. Okay. Thank you very much. There was no one in line, so I thought I'd come up again. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> so it, it's unusual, rare, and it, it's not beyond 
coincidence, perhaps, that you know you got your coronary artery calcium score report. On there, it says the Agatston score. And many of you do not know that we have Dr. Arthur Agatston right here. <laughs> I'm going so, to so, so repeat. By the way, uh, okay, well, I was going to repeat what he said to help, yes. like the the audience at home. Basically, you. You just explained that we're doing the right thing because if we're going year to year, it's, it's tougher to look at calcification. And that was actually something we determined early on. There were some people who were like, well, why don't you just you know, look at the CAC, coronary artery calcification? And, and we, we were like, no. I, and there's a couple of things, and you could probably speak to this better than I could. I myself think there's some, you know, for lack of a better word, inertia of some kind. There's some degree of healing process that there's, you know, it gets brought up with statin trials for that matter, that there's some consolidation that can come into place. And we just don't know enough yet as to what that process is, even if you knew the perfect diet, the perfect medication for which you're going to halt atherosclerosis and you started that protocol at day zero, does that mean calcification wouldn't increase? I'm not convinced that it, I'm not convinced that it wouldn't increase. I think that there's very likely that part of that process, so. Well, or you might know Dr. Agustin from the South Beach diet. Oh. If you've heard of that. Yeah, author and uh, of the you know, franchise, um, low carb, yay. Um, <laughs> but but I, do have, I do want to make that separation. I have a beef with Jeff Gerber and Ivor Cummins. Uh, notor, they are uh, notori notoriety. well known in the keto community. <laughs> for writing a book that talked about the coronary score and Ivor Cummins, a non-physician engineer, not computer <laughs> guy, um, actually, you know, was funded to promote the coronary score because there was a widowmaker lesion found on a coronary score by a prominent uh, uh, man who anyway, saved his life the coronary score. However, it's opened up a can of worms in my practice as I try to explain the year-to-year -year variability of a coronary score and where it comes. So I have a problem with Jeff and Ivor or putting a book out there, so then now it complicates my life. <laughs> I, this is all to make the distinction that you're not looking at the coronary artery calcium score. Not that it's not good. It, it's <laughs> actually <laughs> CT angiography, which is, I think, a, a step better. It, this is just to clarify, a lot of us don't know these differences, and, uh, and I wanted to just shout out. Come out to the microphone if you can, please. I, this is a rare, a rare chance to... Yeah. I, I think, Eric, you and I would both agree, we like them both, but kind of like tools in a tool set, right? There, it depends on what the, the tool is that you're using. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, no, Ivor's a good friend, and, and Jeff, and um, I'm lovely that they've been promoting the calcium score, but it is useless for following somebody from one year to the next. You're absolutely 100% right. No, it is. It's, it's, yeah, no, absolutely. What, what you see, um, calcium, in fact, they did the, uh, the, was it the, the Belston, I believe, with Provoqual looking for lack of progression in one year. And if you develop a new calcified plaque from a degenerated or ruptured plaque, it takes you know, a few years before you'll see that on the calcium score. And if you look at long-term people are treated aggressively, I hate to say statins in, in this room, but you will see in a population less progression of coronary calcium. But in one year, and what we do in practice is you have to look at at the images side by side, you can over a few years see if there are new lesions. But old lesions get more calcified, they get bigger, which is very helpful. You can tell the age of, of the calcified lesion. And you can tell young ones, you can see the overall progress. But from year to year, forget about it. Absolutely useless. In a non-clinical, in a non-clinical population, um, if it's zero, 
So we have the kind of keto community, coronary score is zero, well that's like a 10 year warranty, you're gonna be fine. Is that true in a non-clinical population? Yeah, that's, uh, my, my colleague, Kerem Nasser, who popularized that, he's, he started that, that the Miami heart trial that Matt was talking about. And, um, and for the general population, it's a 15 year warranty. Um, the exception... Meaning you don't get a tomorrow, cardio... You're not going to have a cardiac event for 50... Because you don't until there's a high score. And the great thing about the calcium score, I'll say something positive after saying negative, is, is it, you'll see a score 20 years before, 20, 30 years before you have an event, which is why early detection um, is important. And in people where you see it young, it's very easy to follow to see if there are new lesions popping up. But even there, you can't go by the score in the individual. You, you, know, you can in, in a population. Um, and so we, we do use it to, you know, to, to follow patients, but looking for new lesions, not the, total, not the total score. The total score will always go up. It'll go up less fast. Uh, Matt Budoff has had studies to that effect um, in people treated aggressively. But in any individual, it's too, we developed a score uh, with, uh, with Warren Janowitz over lunch one day, and if I knew it was gonna be such a big deal, we would have taken more time. You would have had a that committee. Was, that was, uh, a committee yeah, to blame. That was the first I kind of feel that way that. about lean mass hyperresponders. Like when I was writing about it at the time, I was like, oh, this, I may have to refer to this many times over. I would have consolidated it a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that, that was kind of my limited understanding is that at a, things we do at a population level don't always for an individual um, make, uh, draw, you can't draw conclusions from them. Exactly. But, so, and we often make decisions for patients yep. based on what we think is best for the population, but not be, might not be best for an individual. There, there are so many great examples of that. One, just since I have the microphone. Yeah, I think is we have time. That, uh, <laughs> He'll tell us to stop. Time, you'll, you'll let me. Well, for is. Anybody mind that they break the rules? Okay. <laughs> well, in this my, is what we don't get in Zoom calls, by the way. This is uh, good stuff. So keep going. My, in my original life as an echocardiographer, um, people when Doppler came started to calculate aortic valve areas, and you can make a great R value, a great correlation. So. People are saying, oh, your, my, your aortic valve area is 0.6, you need surgery. But that's, in a population, there's a correlation. In individuals, it could be 0.6, you do it the next day, it's 1.1. Mm. And so that's what you're talking about. And that's true of calcium score for progression. Now, if you have any plaque at all, especially at a young age, then you know, you're, it's the only cause of it is atherosclerosis. So there, it's very helpful in individuals. But for progression, it's got to be big populations if you're using the score. What do you, uh, what do you think of the inflammation story? Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. So there's kind of a competing hypothesis of atherosclerosis, and that's inflammation. And there's a little known book authored by me and Jimmy Moore called, <laughs> called Cholesterol Clarity. And it basically was the uh, podcast of scientists who pretty much were convinced it was inflammation, not cholesterol itself, or it's also called the pleiotropic effects yeah. of statins. And it could be kind of the intersection of why all of these things have some effect. But what, what's your I, take now? No, I agree uh, inflammation is really important. I think most of the inflammation comes um, from metabolic syndrome to so talk about tomorrow, which we're not diagnosing nearly early enough. That's where the craft test is really helpful. And so I think most of the inflammation comes from metabolic problems, but it's so as an independent predictor in somebody who passes a craft test, which is the minority of the American population, um, you know, I, don't think, uh, well, the, the story of, of, of seed oils and other things, but, I, but that, that exacerbates uh, metabolic syndrome as well. So inflammation is really important. I think most of the cause has to do with, with visceral liver fat from metabolic syndrome. 
Yeah, I just want to, hi, Dr. Agustin, uh, yeah. um, my father, I'm texting him back and forth. He lives in Wisconsin. It's because of your test 11 years ago that he found out he had 11 blockages in his heart and he had open heart surgery. He was asymptomatic. He travels overseas as a missionary. And I'm so glad that you created this and he found it so that he could have his surgery and continue to live a long life. He's 78 and continues to travel worldwide. And so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And can I have a selfie hey. with you? <laughs> That's a great Do you want story. a picture? Is that? No. <laughs> a selfie. Oh. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I never get tired of hearing stories like that. So that's. Uh, well, that's, didn't you become a doctor to help people? <laughs> and well, maybe by not. the way, the calcium score, just it's part of national guidelines fairly prominently now, but not until just a couple years ago. I think it should have been. So I have to put in my one engineer footnote, because you were talking about the inflammation aspect of it. I, I do feel inflammation gets maligned a lot, but a lot of times it's because people are confusing inflammation with that which it's being the response to. We would, of course, die without inflammation. And yeah. a lot of times when people are saying, we should limit the inflammation, we just try to stop the inflammation, we should uh, you know, arrest it. And a lot of times that appears to fix the problem, but usually at the cost of something else that the inflammation was going for. You usually want to go for the root cause. So I, I totally agree on yeah. that front. And is 100 people enough to make a pilot? <laughs> a pilot? With, with Matt Budoff and the CT angiogram, yes. It'll be enough. Okay. Now, the age, it can be an issue because if you're having really young patients, even, I mean, in people with FH, they start, they'll have coronary calcium in their 20s and their 30s. We don't usually test until much, until much later. So, if your hyper responders are all really young, that would be a, a confounding uh, variable. I don't, I don't know, of course, because they're not recruited yet, I don't know what the mean age is going to be. I can tell you, though, in the Lean Mass Hyperspondor Facebook group, it runs the gambit. They're, they're from all ages, and it's usually just when it is that they started the ketogenic diet, if they were already more likely metabolically healthy, and especially if they're, they're lean-ish. It's... And, Again, also, depending on how low carb they are, it's almost, a prescript, it's almost prescriptive, right? It's almost yeah. something you can count on. I think a lot of times people associate it with being younger because it just happens to be that younger folks are more likely metabolically healthy in the U.S. especially. Yeah, I mean, and the, the one other point, because it's, it's, it's duration. Um, if you have been dealing randomization of people like with FH, you know, they're exposed their whole life, and so they will have calcification early. Um, if the onset um, of your really high L LDL um, is later, there's less you know, dose exposure, so you, you fit uh, FH by 190. But if they're really young without a lot of years, of, it's still very good to know well, let me, yeah. me kind of add to that because I think this will put in perspective. I know, I did a recent count. I know at least of the people I've been in communication with that there's at least uh, over 100 who I know fit homozygous FH levels, which is to say their LDL is 500 or higher, right? Now, that's, that's homozygous FH. The, um, the little girl I spoke of earlier, her LDL was, I think, 783. I it was know a Stor Stormy Jones, right? Was her name that they Oh yeah, I, I yeah. would know you I you might That's, know. I I know at least a dozen me. people have an LDL of 700 or higher. And with all of these folks, I'm saying I can't emphasize enough. I'm not a doctor. This is uncharted territory. Even if a lot of the anecdotal data looks good from fellow lean mass hyperresponders, you need to be aware that 99% 99.9% .9 of doctors and phys physicians around the world would tell you you're in severe danger. And with that said, there are some who have severe abnormalities that they're working through for which keto has been a lifeline to them and say, you know what, I'm willing to take my chances because I cannot live with this other condition I have. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak anonymously about one individual that I know who has an LDL higher than that little girl I was talking about, and she's had it for think around two and a half years or something along those lines. 
and I think her LDL is, it hovers between like 600 and 1,000, her LDL, right? And of course, and she's super, super up on the research. She, know, she knows a lot more about, she knows a lot about carotid intima media thickness tests. She's had some very advanced ones. She has practically a cardiology team wrapped around her, right? And so, of course, her anecdotal uh, evidence, as I'll mention right now, looks promising because we have a direct comparison with the little girl that Brown and Goldstein saw up to this point. And if you think of the lifetime, the LDL burden over time, she should be in, worse, in a worse situation because she's not just born, right? She has the right. lifetime burden of what it was from before that point. And therefore, if anything, she should be developing those symptoms faster. Now, again, I bring up this example with emphasis that we don't know enough. This is an anecdote, and we shouldn't rely too much on anecdotes. We should want perspective data so that we can find out. Because, for example, it could turn out that for a large number, for the 100 lean mass hyperresponders, it's looking good, but it turns out, say, 5 or 10 of them have a pronounced increase of atherosclerosis, and the others don't. And then we're happy to at least have some wider spectrum data to find out why that is for that group. Don't rule out any of these possibilities until we can actually get it. In the meantime, I'm fully acknowledging that this is uncharted territory, and as much as the word pioneer can be romanticized, it's usually based on those who are successful in their endeavors and their adventures, right? This is why, you know, it, it, let me just kind of wrap it up in this one way to, to put this forward. If I really did believe lean mass hyperresponders were 100% safe, I'd just get back to doing technology. I wouldn't have worked so hard to put together this study. So while I'm cautiously optimistic, it is an acknowledgement of uncertainty. I'm cautiously optimistic. I lean towards feeling pretty good about this, but I really do want this kind of data to, to have a better sense of where we really stand. And Dave, one of the good news about this is you don't have an infarct with your first plaque. So if they follow up with imaging, which they should do both with your know, coronary um, and their carotid, um, you know, if they're developing, you, you, have, you have time. Um, people don't have, die from their first plaque. So just a quick question. For your lean mass hyperresponders and those homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, are you seeing a trend of APOE4s largely in those groups? You know, this actually comes up a lot, very often, uh, because I thought the same thing. In fact, I think it was in our original FAC for cholesterol code when I was first developing it. But now that there's such a large population of lean mass hyperresponders, I think there's just the slightest leaning towards APOE4, but in truth, I, kn I now know plenty of people who are APOE 2.2s and 2.3s and 3.3s. Um, I know Eric's been doing this for a while. You've probably seen for yourself. It's, there's, there doesn't seem to be that much of a... Thus far, we've not been able to find anything genetic that's a solid through line. It, it, it's, and that's also part of what I think is kind of exciting to me as an engineer, is here you see this ubiquitous profile that's not just on one lipid axis, but on three lipid axes that goes across all these different ethnicities and ages and genders. Mechanistically, that's kind of exciting. So. There are so many different metabolic things that happen when you go from eating carbs, burning carbs, to not eating carbs and burning fat, that it's like going from the earth to the, the moon. I mean, we should be able to predict things better, but all of the data are from carb eaters. So with all due respect, the, the, exactly. the yeah. 10 year, 14 year warranty of zero coronary score is from people who eat carbs. So that could reassure you or it might not reassure you. <laughs> so I mean, this could be the, the anomalous retrograde motion of the planets, the, yeah. the LDL being high not causing something that brings down the whole house of cards of the LDL hypothesis. Yeah, absolutely agree. Did you hear that? <laughs> Absolutely agree. And, and, and I just have to say one last thing, and that's thank you for being here and being humble, yet, you know, a giant uh, in the medical world. I just want to let you know that. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Speaking you, you are all my giants. Speaking of giants in the world, Steve. Oh, hey, great to see you. Introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi, Dave. I'm Steve, and I'm a recovering academic. 
<laughs> Steve Finney. I just want to say a couple things, hopefully briefly. One is, it's rare that you're at a meeting, even major academic meetings, where you have this kind of conversation, this kind of forward-looking, exploratory thing where people are not defending you know, their, their life's work in the, in the, uh, against progress. And it's, and it's just a remarkable conversation. And you really need to appreciate this. It's a remarkable moment. Um, and just a, a couple comments about your protocol. I mean, this is, um, it's a pilot study, obviously, as Dr. Bodoff uh, noted. It's a big pilot study, and I think it's, it's, it's going to be a unique data set. Um, I'll mention, you probably recall, that I published a paper a few decades ago entitled The Hypercholesterolemia of Major Weight Loss. Um, and it, uh, study, we studied six um, overweight women who lost at least uh, 40 pounds, and it was a result of seeing in my uh, weight loss practice with a very low calorie ketogenic diet that uh, within a few months of starting a very low calorie ketogenic diet, the successful weight losers had a tendency for their cholesterol to rise. But uh, even before we did the, the prospective study, which where we didn't just watch their, their cholesterol and you know, we didn't have um, anything other than HDL and LDL, we didn't have NMR and things like that. But um, it's interesting that they, with their weight loss, their HDL did not go up during the weight loss, but their LDL went up, and some of them were true hyper-responders. So I would mention that you know, it's not just lean mass hyper-responders, there are hyper-responders within the weight loss community who you know, still are significantly obese. And it appears to be that when people lose weight, a lot of weight, free cholesterol that's stored, dissolved in the adipose tissue droplet, that free cholesterol, um, uh, as the droplet shrinks, reaches a critical saturation and has to be mobilized out because you don't want crystals of cholesterol forming in your, your adipocytes. Um, and so it, it, uh, that raises the question of weight loss, antecedent weight loss in the hyper-responders that you're going to recruit for this study. And will you be taking a weight history from them and, and asking, you know, are you going to see a different response in those people who um, were relatively lean in with when they adopted the, the low carb diet as opposed to uh, when they um, uh, have lost a lot of, maybe a lot of weight and got to a lean mass. Uh, is that a factor you're going to uh, prospectively examine? So I, th I think I have to defer that one back to Lundquist. Um, I may be able to talk to you privately about it um, a little bit later. I, I likewise agree and, and it actually kind of fits the model, I would take it a step further beyond, beyond the what's stored in the lipid droplets. As I understand, about 95% of it or something is triglycerides, but the 5% is relevant because it's lipids of other uh, origin. But on top of that, there's literally the bilayers of the adipocytes themselves are also shedding, uh, which actually I learned from your colleague, Bolick, in, from 2018, when I was first trying to get a, a, a grasp on how the adipocytes can actually shrink. They're not literally squishing you know, the phospholipids free cholesterol together to shrink something that's got a, a mono or bilayer, it's got a shed. Mm -hmm. And to grow it, it's got to acquire, right? So for sure, if you're losing weight, you're, you know, releasing more of those. And I actually literally gained 19, I don't know if you knew about this, I did an experiment where I gained 19 pounds of, of weight, it was mostly fat, in 2018, and then lost it again, most of it, not all of it. Um, <laughs> But I track, I track my lipids daily, and I'd love to show you that graph. It's almost a perfect inverse pattern in that you can see my LDL started at around 130 um, at, the, at the nadir, and then moved up as my weight lost, and the regression curve was like 95% or something like that. It was an R2 of 95, 0.95. Um, so yeah, I definitely think if you're actively losing weight, it's very relevant. But that's part of our decision making on having people be on the diet that they're on for two years kind of helped resolve a bit of that given the survey data that I'd already collected. So there's a standing survey that I have that has about a thousand entries into it. And we're actually doing another paper on that here pretty soon. Um, but I think that helps in that regard. 
But there's one other factor, and you may have this from your own data, which is if somebody is actively losing weight, typically their triglycerides aren't really low. They may not be high, but they're typically not, say, under you know, 70 or under 80 milligrams per deciliter if you're actively losing weight. And that, by the way, applies to when it was happening to me. And one other real brief comment, and that is I noticed that you're going to be uh, 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 in your uh, laboratory analysis looking at C-reactive protein. Uh, are you, in this protocol, are, you, are your friends at uh, UCLA going to uh, save serum uh, for subsequent uh, additional analyses? Because yes. Yes. Uh, CRP is the slowest responder to a, a well-formulated ketogenic diet. It takes two or three months to come down, whereas other biomarkers come down more quickly. Um, and uh, yeah, interestingly, CRP is the, appears to be the only inflammation biomarker that responds to atorvastatin and simvastatin. You know, it said that, that statins are anti-inflammatory, but all they seem to bring down is CRP. And when we've looked at, at uh, um, our population in the IOH trial, we have not published the, the, inflammation, the full inflammation data yet, uh, but it appears that um, we presented this at it's an abstract format at uh, end of chronology, uh, end of 2020. It looks like the only, for people who are on statins at the start, their level of CRP is lower uh, huh. at baseline than the other biomarkers. And then the other biomarkers come down when we put them on the well-formulated ketogenic diet, but, the, but statins don't appear to have an effect. And again, we haven't studied this prospectively, but in retrospective analysis, it looks like CRP is not the typical uh, biomarker of, of, of the inflammatory response to a ketogenic diet. So if you save serum, I want to come by and pick some up. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll make it quick. I, I applaud this study, and I think it's wonderful that it's going to go forward. The, 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 the one, or, or one potential flaw that I see in the design of the study is that, um, you know, you're going to be, the comparison group are the healthy part of the population and their plaque progression, and that's what we're going to be comparing it to. So the assumption is that this is a healthy group of people, but by definition, these are people who have chosen to engage in a very restrictive diet for two or more years almost certainly to treat a chronic health condition, which might include autoimmune disorders and other disorders. And although the dietary intervention might be an effective treatment for them, that autoimmune process may put them at higher risk for cardiovascular disease and plaque progression. And so I worry about comparing this group's plaque progression to the quote unquote healthy general population's plaque progression. I, I have a, a, an answer that's technically a non-answer, non but it's an answer, which is there's criteria beyond the major criteria that Lundquist will take participants through that may address that. Dave, can I help you with a standard reply? Sure. It's just a pilot study. 